All right, let's go ahead and wrap up our lecture for chapter 7. So in the, this region, all right, so here we have Turkey. All right, uh, this is where the, uh, where the uh, Byzantine Empire would have been located, Turkey and Greece and, you know, Eastern, Southeast Asia, uh, North Africa, Palestine, right? So all this is the Eastern Mediterranean. That's where the Byzantines would have been. Uh, so from all the way over here in the country that we now call Kazakhstan, uh, in the region of Central Asia, we see a group of people start migrating out of Kazakhstan. Uh, some of them will move into Afghanistan and Pakistan and India down here. Uh, some of them will move into Iran and Iraq and mix with the people of Persia and Mesopotamia and even go as far as Egypt. And then another group of people are going to move into Turkey, right? And Kazakhstan was the home of a nomadic group, a nomadic tribe called the Turks, and um, they 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 were nomadic. They you know fought on horseback. They were pastoralists. They raised you know animals. Uh, they weren't farmers, and they start migrating uh, mainly because of drier conditions. Right, the environment is getting uh, drier, meaning it's harder to maintain the the pastoral lifestyle because there's less grass. Uh, so they start migrating and they start settling down, becoming or adopting farming, becoming agriculturalists. Um, so they, as they, you know, settle, uh, as they migrate, they start settling and blending in with the, the local people. Uh, so the same thing happens with the Turks and they move eventually into Turkey. And these, the, the first of the two groups are called the Seljuk Turks. And then there's another group, another wave of migrants called the Ottoman Turks. And basically, these two groups uh, slowly, right? So it wasn't like a conquest; it was more like a migration. They slowly start taking over uh, territory of Anatolia, right, which is the original name for Turkey. Uh, and they slowly uh, make their way into Anatolia, uh, looking for farmlands. And Anatolia is super rich in farmland. Uh, and as they blend in with the uh, Muslims living there, they start adopting Islam. And um, uh, as the Byzantines lose Anatolia, they lose their major food production area. Uh, so they, they start suffering from you know, lack of food surpluses. And eventually we see that as the more and more Turks come in and blend with the Muslim population, uh, we see a lot of the Byzantines actually want to switch over uh, to Islam and want to uh, support the Turk leadership instead of the Byzantine leadership because uh, the Turks, you know, provide more equality and provide new opportunities uh, that the Byzantine peasants wouldn't have had otherwise. So eventually we see that this group of Turks, uh, the Ottoman Turks and the Seljuk Turks, they're going to conquer uh, Constantinople in the year 1454, right? Uh, which is one of the marking periods, one of the turning points uh, that brings an end to Unit 3, right, time period 3, which ends in 1450. When, uh, unit 3, by the way, goes from 600 to 1450. Um, so the, um, the city of Constantinople gets conquered. The Byzantine Empire will eventually come to an official end, and it will be, the city will be renamed the, um, the city of Istanbul. And eventually the Byzantine Empire will be uh, kind of like re-imaged into the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and the Ottomans get their name from their leader. They supported an emperor, right? even though they call him Sultan, he's still an emperor, called Osman. And we'll talk about the Ottoman Empires at a future chapter. So the, the Byzantine Empire ends in 1454, uh, and the Ottoman Empire takes over it, and the that's pretty much end of the Byzantines. But like I mentioned before, the Byzantine culture and Christianity continued elsewhere. And that's what we're going to look at last, at the region called Kiev and Rus. All right, so here we have the Byzantine Empire, right? Uh, but north of that, right, in what we now call Eastern Europe and, and Russia, there was a territory called Kiev and Rus. And Kiev and Rus was basically a collection of city-states. They weren't really like an empire or kingdom. Uh, and the people that lived there were the Slavic people. Uh, and they have different nationalities nowadays uh, and different languages, but they're all kind of united because they have a similar language, which is Slavic. Uh, so, for example, Russia, Ukraine, Poland, Slovakia, Czechoslovakia, 
or the Czech Republic, Serbia, Slovenia, Croatia, right? Those are all countries in Eastern Europe uh, or near Russia that are of primarily Slavic population. Uh, and eventually they, um, they start trading with the Byzantine Empire and uh, the major city that they had is Kiev, right, which is right here in Ukraine. Uh, so that's why it's called Kiev and Rus. So the Rus are uh, basically, so you have all these kind of like small communities, small farming towns and, and a few cities like Kiev. Uh, and they're fighting and competing against each other as, you know, city states tend to do. And eventually uh, we see new people coming in. Uh, these are the Vikings, which we'll talk about more in, in another chapter. Uh, and the Vikings uh, will become known as the Rus, uh, and they are basically come in and are and are you know as raiders and attackers and uh, sometimes as merchants and traders. Uh, but eventually, they choose these Rus as their leaders, right? The Slavic people did, um, and those, the the Vikings become the leaders, and and they become known as the Rus. Uh, and eventually, the um, the mixing of these two cultures will create kind of like a unique culture here in Eastern Europe. Uh, and eventually the rules will, will, the leaders, the princes will move into Russia, move into Moscow. And the rules is, of course, uh, the, the birth of Russia. Um, so Kievan Rus uh, was the, the major city at that time before there was Moscow. Uh, they had many, you know, kings. Uh, remember, they're not an empire. Uh, or many princes actually and uh, they had this one guy called Vladimir uh, and he is important because he adopts Christianity Orthodox Christianity he marries into the Byzantine royal family uh, his son creates the Russian uh, legal system that is you know is still uh, was used for a long time throughout Eastern Europe uh, and they adopt Christianity Orthodox Christianity including the architecture and stuff like that um, and one of the issues with the Kievan Rus because of their, their, their environment is that it's pretty difficult to maintain an agricultural surplus. Uh, so when you have too many people in your city, you start, uh, you start selling them. Uh, so they produce a slave trade with Constantinople and uh, with the Byzantines. Uh, and in fact, this is where the word slave comes from. It comes from the slave trade created by um, by the Slavic people of Kiev and Rus. And uh, besides slaves, the people of Constantinople, uh, they want you know things that they can't get, stuff like honey and hides and furs and timber, uh, all which are uh, present in the forests of Eastern Europe and Russia. And uh, so here we see you know slave trade, uh, you know markets in Kiev and Rus, uh, where people were, were enslaved. So it wasn't like, um, uh, you know, it wasn't through conquest or anything, it was just people, whoever got kidnapped, got sold into slavery, basically. Uh, and it was a way to keep the population manageable. Uh, so Orthodox Christianity, of course, uh, is the religion of the Byzantine Empire, uh, headed by the Byzantine Emperor and the Patriarch of the Church. And, um, like I mentioned, the because the Kievan Rus rely so much on the Byzantine Empire, uh, it is to their benefit to convert to Christianity, uh, because then the uh, the Byzantines and the the, the Slavic people uh, are you know equal to each other. And uh, as I mentioned before, the guy Saint Cyril, he's the one that uh, is a missionary who converts a lot of the people, but also Prince Vladimir, he's also he's the one that makes the religion. Christianity, Orthodox Christianity, the official religion of the Kievan Rus, uh, and we see a lot of trade uh, develop between you know Kievan Rus and the Byzantines. So we see cultural diffusion, right? The culture of the Byzantines slowly spreads into uh, that of Eastern Europe, of Kievan Rus, of Russia. Uh, uh, then things get bad, right? Uh, and Kievan Rus will fall. All right, they'll get conquered by a group of invaders, uh, nomadic people from the Central Asian steppe. But these are not the Turks that we mentioned you know, previously, but these are going to be, wait for it, the Mongols. So the Mongols, one of the many places that they conquered, uh, is Eastern Europe, is Kiev and Rus in Russia. 
uh, and the Mongols that ruled there were known as the Golden Horde. And the Mongols came in, they conquered, they ruled, but the Mongols really didn't like um, Kievan Rus. They didn't really like Eastern Europe, they really didn't like Russia all that much. Um, part of the reason um, is that the uh, Eastern Europe is very, very um, uh, cold, uh, but it's also very, uh, there's, there, there's a lot of rainfall, right? And the, the Mongols relied on their horses a lot. And the problem with, you know, having horses where the ground is wet all the time is that their feet, right, their hooves can get infected uh, and grow weak uh, due to all the moisture. So the Mongols didn't really like going into Russia all that much. Uh, so what they did is that they set up a tribute system. And um, uh, so going back a bit before we talk about the tribute system. So the, the Khanate of the Golden Horde, they conquered Russia. Uh, they destroy the city of Kiev. Uh, the leadership of Kiev moves to, to Moscow, right, which will become the capital of, uh, of Russia, as still is. Uh, because Kiev and Rus depended so much on the Byzantine Empire, and the Byzantine Empire was getting weaker and weaker and weaker, uh, Kiev and Rus also became weaker, and explains why they got conquered so easily. Uh, so the, the, the Mongols, they rule indirectly, meaning that they're not in charge, they're not running things, uh, but basically they come in uh, and demand tribute, and the, the Russians had to pay tribute, uh, which made it very difficult for Russia to grow in wealth, right, because any profit that they had, they had to basically give it to the Mongols. Um, but one of the things that the Mongols did was that they didn't force the Russians to change anything, uh, force the, the people of Kievan Rus to change anything, uh, so they got to keep their traditions and their religions. Uh, an effect of this you know, invasion is that in order to produce enough food to not only survive, uh, or produce enough goods not only for survival, but also to pay off the tribute to the Mongols, is that the Russian peasants are forced into serfdom. Uh, so a peasant just, you know, like a poor, landless, you know, person uh, who's a farmer. But a serf is almost like a slave. Uh, so they don't have any rights. For example, they can't even leave the farm that they work in without permission. Uh, they don't really own anything whatsoever. Uh, they're only given a portion of what they grow, what they produce. And the reason, again, is because the landlords, the princes of Russia want to maximize the wealth that they get, plus pay off the Mongols, then it's all at the expense of the Russian serfs, uh, who gain absolutely nothing from any of this. Uh, so uh, we see that by, you know, 1300s, 1400s, uh, and, you know, 1200s, Russia starts adopting serfdom, uh, and we're going to notice in another chapter that that's around the same time that Western Europe stops using serfs. And eventually, uh, the Russians will rise up against the Mongols, kick out the Mongols uh, by 1480, and create the, uh, you know, the kingdom and eventually the empire of Russia. But again, that's not another chapter. Now, last thing I want to mention about Kiev and Rus is another major city, right? So Kiev being the, the political leadership, political capital, uh, another city was Novgorod, and Novgorod was a trade center, right? And it was a cosmopolitan trade center, meaning that they had multicultural people from all over. So they had Germans, they had Russians, they had Slavs, uh, they had people from Sweden, from Scandinavia. And they are going to be part of this new trade network that is going to develop, and we'll talk about it in another chapter, uh, called the Hanseatic League, right? Which is trading all over North Europe. And they traded, you know, again, things that other people want, like fur and honey uh, and clothing. And uh, Novgorod grows into a huge, huge, huge city, one of the largest ones uh, in all over Europe, uh, with 400,000 people. And uh, Novgorod is a, um, uh, becomes his major trade center. And eventually the city will get conquered by the uh, newly formed Russian Empire uh, around the 1500s. Uh, but it's important to note that this city, like many other cities, like Venice, for example, uh, will grow in size and wealth 
uh, because of its central location to train networks, right? Uh, and that's it for chapter seven. Thanks for watching.